welcome to Ombersley. We're right here in the middle of the village, as you can hear from the traffic noise behind me, and in the churchyard of St Andrew's Church, which as, uh, was at the heart of the village, is at the heart of the village now. And as you can see, it looks like a very smart village behind me. Those three red brick houses, they were owned by Lord Sands, the Lord of the Manor at Ombersley Court behind the church they were homes to some of the most wealthy members of the village. But Ombersley was not all about wealth. Ombersley was a very rural parish at this time. It's a big parish. It runs from Horford Bridge down the A449 from here to the south, all the way up to the Mitre Oak, a distance of about seven or eight miles. And it runs from the River Severn over on the west, right across to Westwood Park on the edge of Droitwich to the east. So it was a big area. There were lots of orchards and there were lots of hop fields at one stage. And there were peas. The children from the school would pick the peas. So there are very often reports in the school logbook of children being off school for impromptu holidays to go and help out with the farming. At the time of the war in 1914, Worcestershire had 3,622 acres of hop fields. That's a lot of hops. These days there's just one hop farm. There were 21,385 acres of orchards. These days a lot of those orchards have gone but they're there in our common memories because there are apple tree closes, Cherry Orchard Drive, uh, Pear Main Avenue and St John's, all these places like that where once there had been many many acres of fruit. And of course that means that the population of the parish, those who weren't the wealthy ones living over there at Kelso and Storks, were labourers, farmers, market gardeners. Some of them, like the keeper of the wharf inn, had, uh, they kept the inn, but they also had a small market garden and cherry trees that they farmed and made a side income from. So as we go round this village today and as we explore the history of the people who lived here during World War I, we're going to find that there were people who went to fight, but there were people who had to stay behind to make sure that food production continued and the people of Ombersley and the country could be fed. We're in the churchyard now of St Andrew's, Ombersley, uh, which is at the centre of the village and would have been the focus every Sunday for the church service, for the villagers to come and pray for their men who are fighting abroad, their daughters who are volunteering, and just to think about uh, and pray for their own, their own happiness as well. And we're here um, in this graveyard because there are five young men buried here with Commonwealth War graves who came home to die because of their wounds, because of illness, and this gentleman here, Private Joseph Weston, died in June 1917 and I've focused on him today because he is the first young man that the village would have been able to bury themselves. Of course everyone who went to fight and was killed was buried where they fell abroad, that was the rule at the time, and so um, there was nothing physical to mourn. And I found an account from earlier in the year, January 1917, which gives us an idea of the sense of ghosts at the table. The vicar, um, uh, vicar Reverend Webster, held a choir supper in January 1917. And in the newspaper, I found an article that describes how he entertained the adult members of the choir. And he mentioned that this was the 21st year that they had gathered together. So you've got this sense of joint history. And while they're sitting there, he, sa he raises a toast to the young men of the choir who have gone to fight and have not come back. And those young men are Messrs A. Webster, W. R. Page, J. Blunt, Percy Biddle and Freddie Skerritt. These are, well, A. Webster is his son, Aubrey. W. R. Page is the son of the school teacher just up the bank. Um, and Blunt, Biddle and Skerritt, they were young farm lads from the rest of the village you have suddenly a very present sense of a ghost, five ghosts at that table. So it's something that it's hard to think of today, but I think this project has really brought home to people is how when you physically start to map a village, you get a very definite sense of the relationships and the losses that were felt daily.
So as I say, here we are by Joseph Weston's grave. And again, I found an account in the local paper of his funeral that took place at the end of June 1917. And it says here that it, he died of meningitis in Bromsgrove Hospital. So I don't know whether he'd been wounded and it was sepsis or whether he became ill on the way home for, for leave. But anyway, it says that his funeral was very well attended and that volley of shots were fired over his grave. He was given full military honours and you have this sense that the whole village probably turned out whether or not they were regular churchgoers because this was one of their own whom they could honour at home. And it's lovely to see that the grave now has poppies on it that were made by school children as part of the project and are placed there on the grave as a memory to him. And as a sort of extra to this story, I was, uh, as I was doing the research of the project and I gave a talk at the end of the project and Basil Lamb, who is the sexton here, told me that his mother had been engaged to Joseph Weston at the time of the war and was due to marry him, but unfortunately he died. And so, of course, she married someone else, Mr. Lamb, lucky Mr. Lamb. But many, many years later, when she died, Basil was clearing the churchyard to get it ready for his mother's funeral. And he found a rifle cartridge just here by Joseph's grave, a World War I proper calibre rifle cartridge. And he said, I think that was probably one, the one from the volley. And I said to him, did you keep it? Have you still got it? And he said to me, no, I put it in my mother's grave. He lived at the top of the village in Mortimer Terrace when he went away to fight and he was a jobbing gardener. And what's always interesting about Mr Butler here is that he died in September 1920. Now there are as I, said earlier, as I said earlier, there are four other people buried in the graveyard, three of whom died after armistice on the 11th of November, 1918. And so people say, well, well, you know, how does that work? Well, there was an act of parliament which specified the end of the war. Um, and the end of the war for that, for insurance purposes and financial purposes, administration and so on, was the 31st of August, 1921. And so consequently, you get Commonwealth war graves for serving servicemen until that date. So he died still on active service. He could have been in Palestine, he could have been in Mesopotamia, or he could have just been in a reserve regiment back here in barracks in Britain. But that is how he comes to have a war grave even after the end of the war. Right, we're outside Red Marley House now, which is just opposite the church. And it's a house that uh, at the time belonged to the Sands Estate. It was built in 1823. It's terribly fancy. And during the war, this was the home to William Lucas, a retired silversmith from Vide Street in Birmingham, in the heart of the jewellery quarter. He and his wife are in the 1901 census. He's down as an engraver and jeweller, and she is marked down as assisting in the business. So they were clearly quite the couple, and they lived here opposite the church. And then as we move down the street, a lot way down the street, yes, it's further than you think, towards the pair of semi-detached houses also built around 1823. We've got what's now called Lee House and this was the house of quite an important man in the village. It was the home of James Wiley Taylor and his wife and children. Now James was born and brought up in Droitwich. He went to Malvern Boys College and then he went on to Cambridge and he came back here to, to the parish and became the relieving officer the registration officer and the school attendance officer. So basically, he was local government personified. And if you wanted to, uh, to, to get some assistance, say from the Poor Law Board of Guardians, it would have been to Mr. Taylor that you applied. And when the census took place in 1911, James Taylor and his wife were the lead enumerators, went round and took everybody's details. So, very important part of the village, this one. You wanted to keep on the right side of Mr. Taylor, if you could. So we'll move along now from Kelso towards this final house in the terrace, sorry, semi-detached houses, and we have got Storks. And this, during World War I, was the home of Thomas Browning. 
Now Thomas had been the landlord of the Wharf Inn down the road towards Holt Fleet until 1913 and then he sold up his licence and he came here. He was a wealthy farmer, he owned properties up in the racks that he rented out to people and he also had a piece of market garden land behind the house which he rented to a chap called Frederick Loch who lived in Parsonage Lane. So this is a chap, he's a bit of a wheeler dealer, he actually came to the village from London. So, so he's not even a local, but he's clearly got his feet right under the table. Oh, you've caught me now. I'm outside the King's Arms having a sneaky coffee. Honestly, just the coffee. Uh, we're here outside the King's Arms and during the war this pub had a landlord whose name was James Millard and he ran that pub with his wife Mary. Now their son Harold joined up in uh, 1914 at the age of 19 so he would have volunteered, he would have been one of the very early lads to join and he went off and served all over the place in Salonika, in France and in Egypt before he did return in 1919. It took a while for men to be demobilised after the armistice in November so you don't find many men getting home much before February, March 1919. Now, as far as we know, Harold came home unwounded, but he came home with epilepsy and this meant that he applied for an army pension because he was unable to work to the fullest extent. And there are papers on ancestry which are kept from the military records in the National Archives which show the struggle that he had with his wife, whom he married in 1920, to get a decent pension. And the government decreed that only about 40% of his, in his injuries were only 40% attributable to his war service. And so he only got a reduced pension. It, it, it symbolises, I think, it's an example of the struggle that many men had to get a decent living when they came home. They may not have been wounded, but they were broken in other ways. So for many years, the war for Harold did not end, and he died in 1925 in Highbury Military Convalescent Hospital up in Birmingham. Now, as we sit here, the pub, the pub changed hands and was taken over by a Mr Franklin and the Millards left the parish, as far as we can tell. Down the road, we've got the Crown and Sands pub, which was established as the Crown Hotel by Lord Sands in the 19th century, as somewhere that he could lodge his guests when they came visiting. And during the war, that pub was run by a chap called Mr Stanton. And there's a chap in the village, Arthur, Arthur Turner, whose mother was a maid there until she was about 14. And he never kept kids on after that because uh, apparently they cost too much to keep. So she then went and worked up the, up the village at the Elms for the doctor, GP, uh, Dr Johnston, who we'll hear about in a little bit. To my right is the Venture Inn now, and that was originally, during the war, the tailor's shop. And local story has it that he could be seen in that bay window, stitching cross-legged to get the best of the light. Right, I've brought you down now to the bottom end of the village. This is the southern end, just by the turn-off from the 449. And this building behind me, with a very distinctively shaped doorway cut in the wall, bet you can't guess, it's the blacksmiths. It's the blacksmith that was owned by Samuel Sanders and his son Samuel. They kept the name in the family. And it is one of five smithies in the village. And here I happen to have a picture from 1909 from the Sphere magazine, which shows, I think, Samuel and Samuel in that very doorway behind me. So I'm right in the doorway now of the forge and uh, I brought you here not just to show you this beautiful building but also to point out that this was just one of five forges across the entire parish of Ombersley. There was another one at the top of the village in Woodfield Road and uh, the Hafners at Lineholt and two more in, in the hamlets on the other side of the 449. And I think it just shows you how important the horse was to rural economy and to uh, not just to power the, the farms and to plough the land but also to carry it from here in Ombersley to the market towns and the railway at Kidderminster to circulate the fruit and the crops that were produced here. So there were also, when you look at the commercial directories for the village, you'll find carters and drovers 
you'll find uh, millers, there are at least two millers that we could find, grocers, bakers, all producing food for sale in the village or for carriage to other parts of the county. Welcome to the racks. Now you might notice that these houses are smaller, much more densely packed and altogether meaner as it were than those big houses in the rest of the village and that's because this area of Ombersley is where the agricultural labourers lived, where the very poor of the village lived. All of these properties that you can see in 1914 were owned by absentee landlords from Bromsgrove, Birmingham, Droitwich and a couple by some people in the village and this is where there were two bedroom, two up, two down at, a, at most houses and we've got evidence from the census of, here we go, of the Griffiths family who lived here and they had eight people in one house. That's mum, dad, father-in-law and a whole bunch of kids all squashed in together. Now if you compare that with uh, Kelso down the road, there was a, a married couple in there, two daughters, four bedrooms. It's quite, quite the difference. Now here in this very poor part of the village um, we found evidence of people who were carters, uh, farm labourers, domestic servants, so they would have left here every day and we stand at the edge of a number of footpaths that all converge on this part of the village going across the countryside to different bits of farmland and different houses. So you can imagine every morning at about six o'clock this would have been quite busy as people had had their meagre breakfast and headed out to work in 1914. It's very hard, we couldn't identify precisely which houses individual people belonged to because of the poverty, because of the fact that they didn't use house numbers in those days, so it was very hard for us to track the route that the census enumerator took around the buildings. But we do know that the Griffiths family, who I just showed you their census entry for, they lived here. Now, young Cecil uh, was one of the earliest casualties of war, he was seven, when war broke out and in early 1915 he was run over at the crossroads by a, a car that was being driven for the deputy mayor of Wolverhampton. So as you can imagine with such a celebrity running down a poor young lad and killing him that made the news and there were lots of coroner's reports and inquests into him at the time. But we also know of other deaths here. We found a newspaper report of an elderly gentleman, Dennis Parry, and his death was attended by the GP, Dr Johnston, and he decided that Dennis had died of neglect, malnutrition, starvation in 1916. There were several men that left here to go and fight. Again, it's very difficult for us to trace exactly which house they came back to, but we do know that uh, brothers Walter and Charles Payne left here in, uh, to join the Army Service Corps and the Royal Marines, and they both returned safely. But Charles spent 10 months as a POW during wartime, so it would be wonderful if we could have found out what he made of it, but I'm sure he was very glad to be home. Right, we're standing outside one of Ombersley's bakeries now. I say one of, there were about three in the village. This one, Colwell House, just down the road, and then one where Checkets is now. And um, one of the reasons I brought you to the bakery is because one thing we found out when we were doing the research was how many of the, 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 the village's tradespeople came from outside the village. So Colwell Bakery was, ma was managed during World War I by Herbert Mark Atwell, who was a chemist's assistant from Ledbury. He was 32 and I can't help wondering if he, he bought the bakery just as the war began and I can't help wondering if he was trying to get an essential trade under his belt so he wouldn't have to serve. He actually went before the military tribunal to try to get out of military service on the grounds that he was a baker and the work of delivery could not be done by a woman. The bread had to be carried over hedges and ditches. Apparently the chairman said, like a steeplechase, and the panel all laughed. His appeal was dismissed and he was sent to serve. Um, Mr. Brotheridge, who just, uh, just over the road, uh, he at Bristol House ran a grocery. He had come also from outside the village. He came from Gloucestershire uh, and 
we also had at Fern House an artist, a watercolorist called Thomas Watson, who came here from Sedbergh in Cumbria. So it's, it's quite extraordinary. The biggest landowner after Lord Sands in the village was a chap called General Marindin, and he owned quite a bit of the land on the other side of the road there. He was actually, he lived in Surrey and he was a general in the Black Watch, so he served all over the empire. So Ombersley is the strange combination of salt of the earth, sons of the soil. Uh, the joiners here at this bakery were local. They were born and bred locally and um, so you get that contrast. Uh, so it was, Ombersley's not always been a village of, of static people. I think there's this perception that, that it always stays the same. But what's also interesting there in some of those stories is about how men did serve, but also how, how they, they managed to stay at home. While we're talking about those, Frederick um, Brotheridge, the son of Mr Brotheridge at Bristol House, he also applied for exemption from military service on the grounds that he was assisting in the grocery business and surely this was an essential trade. But after much discussion by the panel, he was sent to serve and went in late 1916, having got married in the parish church just beforehand. He did come home and they went on to have children and Frederick went on to run a grocery of his own. I brought you to Ombersley School now. Every village has the church at its heart and of course the school. There were about 190 pupils here during World War I, at least that's what it says on the roll. But Mr Page, who was the school headmaster, records regular absences in the school logbook as children were either ill were sent home with what they described as dirty heads, they had lice and nits, or um, they were actually off school and helping their families with farming and the harvest. Mostly during the war, it was business as usual. Uh, the first mention of the war is in early September when Mr Page notes that some of the girls have been sewing shirts for soldiers to send to the front. Mr Page himself was uh, the headmaster. He was 63 when the war began and he was actually, I think, hoping to retire. But given that most of the able young men and many teachers headed straight to the front, then he was persuaded by the Board of Governors to continue. The Board of Governors would have been at that time chaired by Lord Sands and of course Reverend Webster was very involved in the spiritual life of the school. One of the reasons that um, the school is so important to the World War I history of the village is that one, it provides a constant throughout for families, but also Mr Page himself kept a record in the school logbook of the boys who served, his own role of honour and he wrote it in June 1915 and he said these are the old boys of the school who have joined His Majesty's forces and are serving in the war. The above list contains the names of 108 boys, now that's a lot of guys, all of whom have attended the school during my time here. There may be others at a former date whom I have not traced. Our parish has done very well to aid the country, nearly 200 young men having joined the colours. It has made it bad for agriculture and has rendered really necessary the relaxation of the attendance rules. And I am rather surprised that I have but eight boys taken away from school. Mr Page continued to serve here throughout the war. His wife was an assistant teacher and so were his two daughters, Gertrude and Edith. Gertrude married Alfred Avery, uh, a career soldier who'd already served in the Boer War um, and continued throughout the First World War and returned home as the war ended. And Edith, his younger daughter, who married a chap called William Burgess in 1915. We haven't been able to find out very much about William and unfortunately he was killed. And there is an entry in the logbook that, uh, that is made by Mr Page in which he records the, the deaths not only of William, his son-in-law, but also of his own son and of the vicar's son, Aubrey Webster, all of whom died within a month or so of each other in 1916. It's a very sobering uh, realisation um, as this poor man listed the, the, the names of all these young men that he knew. Um, and. By the end of the war, he finally retires in 1918, just before the war ends, and he's clearly broken, his health has suffered, his wife's health 
is really not good. And his daughter Edith has already resigned as a teacher at the school, overcome by her own grief at the loss of her husband at such a young age. And I think in that one family, the uh, service that is, uh, is implied, a son who died, a son who served in North Africa and came back, and a third son who was in the Metropolitan Police throughout the war in London and would have been witness to many Zeppelin raids and other privations of the home front. So I think in the pages and in the school life here, you have an extraordinary microcosm of how hard emotionally it must have been for families throughout the war. So this building that we're now standing by is the Memorial Hall, the Ombudsleet Memorial Hall, and it was built in 1923 and it was raised by subscription. That is that that members of the village, residents in the parish, gave money to create a memorial here for the men that they had lost during World War I. And I think it's very significant that they chose to build a gathering space, a community hall, rather than the usual cross uh, at a crossroads or outside the church. There is a cross outside Ombersley Church. It was installed after World War II in 1946. But after World War I, it seems that the village people decided that it would be better to build a space for community, a social space. And so it's really rather wonderful to think that every time people in Ombersley gather in this hall, as they do very frequently every single day, then they are carrying out an act of remembrance, but also carrying on what these young men fought for, their freedom to enjoy themselves, to play, to come together, to learn, and just to be sociable. We have the memorial hall in the village, but there are also three more memorials, three more roles of honour. One is on the Reredos in the village church, just behind the altar, painted on the wooden panels there. And then there is one in Sitchampton School and one in Ombersley School. Each of these has a slightly different list of names on, so some boys' names are on, are on two or three of them, and some are only on the one. If they were non-conformists, because there was a congregational chapel in the village, so they wouldn't necessarily be on the church memorial. So tracking everybody down is a little bit tricky at times. And what's lovely here is there is a list of the subscribers in the hall, so it lets you know who gave how much. And that includes people who, who had very little to give and gave as little as one or two shillings, which is the equivalent today of about a pound. And then some of the more, uh, more wealthy members of the village, uh, Charles Duveen, the art collector who had a, a farm at Borley, he gave over 30 pounds, which is the equivalent these days of about 3,000 pounds. It's a great deal of money. And and so the other thing that's on the wall and that we found very useful in our researches is the Roll of Honour and it's a beautifully illuminated document. This is a copy of it and it hangs on the wall for everyone to see. The names in the central, the central vignette are of uh, men who died and the names around the edge are of all of those who served in the various corps. Quite a lot of the young men from this village joined the Army Service Corps because they were healthy young farm lads. They were used to carting things about, they were used to heavy loads and organising horses. But a lot also joined the local regiment, the Worcestershires and of course the Warwickshires from just up the way who were recruiting in Birmingham at the time. So it's a wonderful monument and a memory for everyone who comes to see it. The dark cloud inside us Till the boys come home